your guide to bush beans. Just as their name suggests, bush beans grow as a bush, so they aren't a climbing bean. That means they need less maintenance than pole varieties, which need staking for extra support. Bush beans can be eaten raw or cooked, and can also be dried. Bush beans come in three general categories. Green. This includes varieties like Provider, which is tolerant of cool soils, and Blue Lake, a green variety with white seeds. As well, Contender is a popular variety with a strong, unique flavor that stands well in both cool and hot weather. Yellow. This type includes varieties like Goldmine and Golden Wax. Goldmine beans are known for their sweetness and how they grow abnormally upright, while Golden Wax beans are known for their buttery flavor. Purple. This includes varieties like Purple Queen, which is easy to spot in the garden and turns green when cooked. Royal Burgundy is another purple variety that will also turn green when cooked. It's important to note that typically, bush beans are more successful when directly sown as opposed to being transplanted. What's interesting is that typically dark colored seeds have higher germination rates in cool soils compared to white or light colored seeds. When directly sowing, the ideal soil temperature for your bush beans is typically between 70 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 21 to 26 degrees Celsius. Their minimum air temperature tolerance is 60 degrees Fahrenheit, 15 degrees Celsius, while their maximum is 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 30 degrees Celsius. Pods typically don't form properly when air temperatures are higher than 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius. Bush beans grow best in full sun and prefer a soil pH between 6 and 6.5. Although the closer to 6.5, the better. They'll really thrive in light, warm, well-draining soils and won't do well in cold or wet soils. For a continuous supply of beans, plant successively every two to three weeks. In this section, we'll cover soil prep, inoculation, watering, and thinning. We'll also talk about fertilizing and mulching your bush beans, transplanting and companion planting, plus your growing structure options. Soil preparation. Find a spot with well-drained warm soil that gets full sun. Bush beans prefer light soil, so make sure to loosen the topsoil enough so that their roots won't have a hard time growing and anchoring. Adjust your soil with organic matter, as well as other soil amendments if your soil pH, texture, or drainage is off. Use an all-purpose NPK fertilizer and mix it in with your soil before planting. Just be sure to follow the manufacturer's instructions for the amount you'll need. Take out all weeds, rocks, and debris from your soil then level it off to avoid puddling. Inoculation. Before you sow your bush bean seeds, we recommend inoculating them. This is an easy process. Simply mix the appropriate Rhizobia inoculum, which you can get online or from your local garden center, with your bean seeds in a dry container, making sure that each seed is nicely coated before planting. Note, if you have purchased pre-inoculated seeds, then you won't have to do this step. Sowing. Sow your seeds one inch deep and space them two to three inches apart in rows that are about 24 inches apart. In general, seedlings will emerge about 10 to 14 days after you've sown them. Watering. On average, bush beans need one inch of rain per week, which can be measured using a rain gauge. You can water them using a low-pressure trickle-slash-drip system during dry periods or if your beans don't get that one inch of rain. Overhead watering should only be done in the early morning so that the leaves have enough time to dry before the evening. Their soil should be kept moist but not oversaturated and consistent. Even watering is particularly important once the flowers start to grow. That's because flowering is the first step in pod production. Make sure to also avoid touching or handling your bush bean plants when they're wet. Thinning. Once your seeds have germinated and the seedlings have emerged and are standing about two inches tall, 
Thin your plants so that there is at least six inches between them. Fertilizer. It's a good idea to test your soil before planting to see what it needs for nutrients. This will help you choose the right fertilizer, depending on your soil and plants' needs. Bush beans naturally fix nitrogen in the soil, so fertilizers with a high nitrogen content shouldn't be used because any extra nitrogen can lead to poor pod development. In general, you can use an all-purpose NPK fertilizer ahead of planting, mixing it into the top layer of your soil. Keep in mind that your bush beans won't need multiple fertilizations throughout their growing cycle. Mulch. Mulching is optional, and if you choose to do so, apply a thin two inch layer. This can help suppress weeds and reduce the need to cultivate around your plants. Transplanting best practices. Note, it's important to note that bush beans grow more successfully when sown directly, so transplanted beans might not produce very well. Transplant your seedlings four to six weeks after sowing them indoors. First though, you'll want to harden them off. Start the process about a week before you plan to transplant by bringing your pots outside and leaving them in a sheltered place. Slowly, day by day, introduce them to more direct sunlight. If temperatures get too low overnight, or if there is any threat of frost, bring your seedlings back indoors for the night. Then just take them back out in the morning. If you didn't buy previously inoculated seeds, or you didn't inoculate prior to sowing indoors, be sure to add inoculum to each hole before planting your seedlings. Once they're ready for transplanting, space out your plants to a minimum of six inches apart in their rows. If possible, rows should be about 24 inches apart. Dig a hole deep enough so that the root ball easily fits and is in line with the soil line. Cover the top of the root ball with soil and then gently press to firm the soil around the stem. You'll then want to carefully water each plant after they've been transplanted. Companion plants do's and don'ts. Do's. Plant bush beans with broccoli, Brussels sprouts, green and red cabbage, cauliflower, collard, kale, kohlrabi, celery, carrot, cucumber, eggplant, peas, potato, radish, strawberry, arugula, rosemary, sage, Swiss chard, tomato, zucchini, butternut squash, spaghetti squash, and corn. Bush beans benefit many crops when planted together for a few reasons. Mainly, their ability to fix nitrogen to the soil is a big help for vegetables that are heavy feeders, since the added nitrogen boosts their growth and health. Don'ts. Keep your bush beans away from bell peppers, hot peppers, chives, leeks, onions, sunflowers, basil, scallions, shallots, garlic, and fennel. Members of the onion family are harmful to the rhizobia bacteria that work with your beans to fix nitrogen in the soil. Growing structure options. Bush beans are compact plants and are great for growing in tight spaces. As you may have guessed from their name, bush beans grow as bushes, so they don't need staking or trellises for support. Raised beds. Bush beans do well in raised beds, since they're a lot warmer much earlier in the season than most garden beds. Containers. Bush beans can grow in containers, but do not grow more than one plant per pot. As well, five gallons, 19 liters, is the minimum container size that you should use. Planting smaller, compact bush bean varieties, like mascot, will also improve the success you have with growing in planters. Potential pests. Aphids. These tiny pests come in a variety of colors, green, black, red, light orange, or yellow, and mainly feed on the undersides of leaves and stems. What they're actually feeding on is the sap in plants, which ends up causing the plants damage. Aphids also leave behind a sticky substance called honeydew, and they are a pest that's known to spread diseases. Aphids can be tolerated by most plants when their numbers are low, but if there's a lot of aphids, they can stunt a plant's growth and cause a plant's leaves to turn yellow and fall off. Here's what to do. For 
the most part, plants can handle mild aphid infestations. But if they're found, a strong jet of water from a garden hose will wash them off the plants. Spraying plants with water should be done early in the morning so that the plants can dry off during the day. Sticky traps, neem oil, insecticidal soaps, and horticultural oils are also effective against aphids. Just be sure to follow the application instructions on the packaging. Oftentimes, you can also get rid of aphids by wiping or spraying the leaves with a mild solution of water and a few drops of dish soap. One variation includes adding a pinch of cayenne pepper. Soapy water should be reapplied every two to three days, or about two weeks. As well, you can try to attract beneficial insects like lady beetles, hoverflies, and lacewings, all of which are important aphid predators. Make sure to check all transplants for aphids before planting. And keep in mind that aphids aren't very mobile, so it's not uncommon to find one heavily affected plant surrounded by plants that are fine. If this is the case, simply remove and destroy the infected plant. Spider mites. These tiny spider-like pests are about the size of a grain of pepper and can be red, black, brown or yellow in color. They feed on plants, sucking on the plant juices and removing chlorophyll, which is important for a plant's ability to turn sunlight into energy. Then the mites inject toxins into the plants, which causes white dots to appear. Also, affected leaves will become dry and yellow, and those affected leaves can drop from the plant entirely. Oftentimes, there's also some webbing visible on the plant, and the plant's growth can be slowed. Typically, spider mites multiply quickly and thrive in dry and dusty conditions. Here's what to do. Monitor plants for signs of spider mites, paying close attention to the undersides of leaves. Spider mites can sometimes be controlled with a forceful spray of water every other day and it's best to spray them in the morning hours. That's because when plants are sprayed early in the day, those plants have time to dry off, which avoids bacterial or fungal growth from taking place. Hot pepper wax or insecticidal soap can also get rid of spider mites. Just be mindful that certain sprays can also kill off the natural predators of spider mites. Since these natural predators, like ladybugs, are good bugs to have, they should be encouraged in the garden. Leaf hoppers. These tiny wedge-shaped light-colored green or gray insects suck the plant's juices. They can stunt a plant's growth, cause leaves to become spotted, and leaf hoppers also carry and spread many diseases. Here's what to do. Crop rotation, weed control, cover crop planting, and companion planting are all important ways to help lower the risk of damage done by pests. The use of row cover slash insect netting can also help to control leaf hoppers. As well, insect soaps and neem products are both effective ways to prevent and eliminate a leaf hopper infestation. Potential diseases and their solutions. Anthracnose. Small water-soaked spots will appear on a plant's leaves, and eventually those spots will get bigger and turn tan or brown in color with a papery texture. This disease thrives in extremely wet weather, and its spores are usually spread by splashing water. It can grow on any part of a plant, except for on the plant's roots. Here's what to do. Plant disease-resistant seeds when possible, and practice good crop rotation, in general, a three-year rotation is a good place to start. As well, avoid using sprinklers or overhead irrigation and water plants from their base to keep leaves as dry as possible. As well, seeds can be treated with hot water prior to planting, 122 degrees Fahrenheit or 50 degrees Celsius for 25 minutes. If anthracnose is found on any plants, make sure to destroy and compost the crop residue after harvest. As well, make sure to follow recommended spacing guidelines, since air circulation and ventilation is important for avoiding a lot of diseases. 
Finally, when planting in containers, it's important to sterilize those containers before use. Bacterial blight. A disease that causes water-soaked spots to appear on leaves. Those spots will grow and turn brown while also being surrounded in yellow. And when the lesions come together, plants develop a burned appearance. At this point, any leaves that die will remain attached to the plant. Bacterial blight will also stunt the growth of plants, and it can be spread by water, wind, animals, or people. Here's what to do. Plant certified disease-free seeds when possible, and practice good crop rotation. Use drip watering methods, or any watering method that focuses on only watering the base of the plant. Avoid splashing water onto plants and make sure the plant leaves are kept nice and dry. As well, ensure good ventilation and air movement by spacing plants properly. This will also help reduce any humidity around those plants. It's also important to control the growth of any nearby weeds. Another thing that can be done to avoid disease is to treat seeds with an antibiotic before planting to kill off the bacteria. Finally, spray plants with a protective copper-based fungicide before any disease symptoms appear. Bean Common Mosaic Virus This virus causes lesions to form on the leaves of a plant, and it will also cause the plant's roots to blacken. Bean Common Mosaic Virus is either seed-borne or spread by aphids. If the entire plant becomes infected, the entire yield can be lost. Here's what to do. Remove and destroy any infected plants, as well as the surrounding soil. Make sure to also control aphid populations on the plants to prevent the aphid's ability to spread the virus. It also helps to plant resistant varieties, like Lancer, Provider, Blue Bush 274, Golden Butterwax, Royal Burgundy, Tender Crop, and Improved Tender Green. Bean rust. Initially, small yellow slash white spots will appear on the leaves of a plant. Those spots will then grow and develop raised red rust pustules, which are gross pimple-like growths. If the disease is severe, it can cause plants to drop their leaves prematurely. Here's what to do. Water beans in the early morning hours to give plants time to dry out during the day. Drip watering and soaker hoses can also be used to help keep leaves dry, but overhead sprinklers should be avoided. As well, use a slow-release organic fertilizer on crops and avoid excess nitrogen. Prune or stake plants and remove any weeds to improve the air circulation around the plants. Make sure to disinfect any pruning tools, one part bleach to four parts water, after each cut. Finally, use a thick layer of mulch or organic compost to cover the soil after the soil has been raked and cleaned, because mulch will prevent the bean rust disease spores from splashing back up onto the plant's leaves. Harvesting. For fresh use. Pick your beans regularly to encourage the plant to continue producing pods. Harvest the beans just after they have filled out, but before they get too large. Typically, bush beans are more tender and sweet when they're small to medium size. For dried beans, allow the pods to stay on the plant until they begin to dry. Once they've started to dry out, uproot the entire plant and hang them in a warm, dry spot until they have completely dehydrated. Collect the beans from the plants and then shell them. Enjoy the peas inside and then keep their shells and plants for composting. Storing. Keep your fresh bush beans in a plastic bag or container in the crisper of your refrigerator. These should keep for about seven to 10 days. If you'd like to freeze your bush beans, you'll have to blanch them first in some hot water. After that's done, store them in a tightly sealed container and leave about one inch of space at the top. You can also freeze blanched bush beans in airtight freezer bags. Properly frozen bush beans should last up to 10 months in the freezer. Bush beans can also be canned or pickled, if that's something you'd like to do. As long as the vacuum seal is intact, 
Canned beans can last up to one to two years. That's great for long-term storage.